irreverent, entertaining, cool. You're listening to LA Talk Radio. You're listening to The Inner Voice with Dr. Fujan Zain, only on LA Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Fujan Zain, and welcome to The Inner Voice Show. This show is about making a difference in your life so that you can create a free mind and a heart filled with love toward creating a fulfilling life for yourself and everyone around you. I will bring you the latest research in the realm of human sciences and will talk to experts in their field to bring you the jewel of their knowledge and wisdom. Let me tell you a little bit about my latest book, Life Reset, The Awareness Integration, Path to Creating the Life You Want. This is the latest psychological model that I'm presenting to you in a series of exercises which you can complete in your own time. In the latest research that we did in Cal State Long Beach and we presented at Harvard University, uh, just by 132 un- uh, university students uh, going through the book the same way that you would, um, resulted in 68% decrease in depression, 27% um, percent, um, reduction in anxiety, and 43% in raising their self-esteem. So I'm sure that if you go through the exercise in the book, uh, it would really create a um, uh, long-lasting effect in your life also. You can get the Life Reset book from my website, fujan.com. F O O J A N dot com. If you also like to consult with me, I have my offices in Irvine, Woodland Hills, and Beverly Hills. And I also do consulting online. So I love to hear from you. Go to my website, fujan dot com, and um, contact me through that. We'll be right back. I'm so honored to have Dr. Philip Zimbardo with me today. Um, Dr. Zimbardo is a professor emeritus at Stanford University and a creator of the Stanford Prison Experiment. Dr. Zimbardo has spent over 50 years teaching and studying psychology. He currently lectures worldwide and is actively working to promote his nonprofit, the Heroic Imagination Project, which you can find more about in www.heroicimagination.org. He has written over 60 books and has over 600 publications. His current research looks at the psychology of heroism. He asks, what pushes some people to become perpetrators of evil? while others act heroically on behalf of those in need. Prior to his heroism work, he served as the president of American Psychological Association and designed and narrated um, the award-winning 26-part PBS series called Discovering Psychology. He has published more than 50 books and 400 professional and popular articles and chapters, among them Shyness, The Lucifer Effect, The Time Cure, The Time Paradox, and most recently, Man Interrupted. I am so excited and honored to have you, Dr. Zimbardo. Welcome to to the Inner Voice Show. I'm delighted to share my ideas with you and your audience. Wonderful. I obviously had watched um, the movie. I had read the uh, articles and the experimentation um, of the experiment that you had before. And I know that um, for a long time um, that took over uh, a lot of what you had looked for, looking at evil, looking at what it was about people to uh, tap into that part of them and how easy it was to tap into a part of them that uh, we call evil. And then after that, you started looking at, well, if we do have those parts, we also have the other parts because it keeps showing everywhere around the world. And your interest shifted uh, for many years now into heroism. Can you, can you tell us your process that took you from one extreme to the other? Well, there are two things that um, are responsible for my transformation. <clears throat> uh, when I was writing the book called The Looser Effect, 
um, the psycho- it's really uh, the psychology of evil. And I was always trying to understand why is it that it's many, many good people do evil of all kinds um, and over, over many, many generations. And in that book, I summarize in great detail uh, what we learned from the Stanford Prison Experiment and what we learned from other research, as well as the Holocaust, Abu Ghraib uh, prison in Iraq. Um, uh, and, and so I, it was 15 chapters, and I was immersed in evil. I was overwhelmed in, in the negative part of human nature. And so in the last chapter, uh, you know, I, I, needed, I needed relief, and I thought, and nobody... No reader is going to go so. Um, no reader is going to continue reading uh, this negative stuff. So the last chapter is the reverse. It's positive. It's it's trying to understand not how good people turn evil, but how ordinary people begin to uh, act heroically. Uh, and so I, I first introduce these concepts of um, uh, uh, everyday heroism. And the amazing thing was, uh, I think the book was came out in 2008, the word hero and heroism did not exist in any psychology textbook, did not exist in the positive psychology movement, which has a huge volume of a human strength and virtue. Compassion is there, empathy is there, heroism is not there. So I said, oh my God, this really needs to be studied. And then the other, the other force that happened was, that year, I gave a talk at the TED conference, and the talk was called The Psychology of Evil. And it was, again, about the prison study, about I was an expert witness of one of the guards uh, who abused prisoners in Abu Ghraib. Uh, and then at the end of that talk, I said, I would, like, I would like us all to entertain the possibility, can we really inspire and train first youth and then anyone to become an everyday hero, not military hero, not political hero, not lifetime hero like Martin Luther King or, or um, Mother Teresa or any of these people whose, whose names we know because of their heroic deeds, but just ordinary everyday people who begin to do daily acts of kindness and compassion uh, to make the world better. Uh, and, and, that, and from that point, I started a, a 501c3, uh, a nonprofit foundation that you mentioned earlier, the Heroic Imagination Project. And so this is the center of, of my, my career uh, from now on. You have spoken about um, the bystander effect where uh, yeah. when someone is watching and um, some act of violence uh, is happening um, or some, somebody needs something, but they, they are the ones who just kind of watch and watch everyone else and kind of get frozen with the culture of that state and whatever it is. Whether the culture is violence, they might do the same, or it right. is just standing. And you talk about reluctant heroes, where uh, you yeah. maybe you call the bystanders the reluctant hero, and the way that the, uh, if one or two people who are standing beside each other come up with an assumption, and then they have it that this assumption is generalized to everyone so then it stops them from acting, um, calling it pluralistic ignorance as if they just stop. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, these concepts that you express in your mm -hmm. articles? Yes, I would be happy to. Now, I think it's more than 50 years ago uh, in New York City, uh, a young woman named Kitty Genovese was coming home from work late at night and she was stalked by essentially a, a guy who turned out to be a crazy psycho, psychopath. And he, he's stalking her, and he, he begins to stab her. Just, just a random woman, you know, I, I think, you know, it's like the first, wo first woman who gets off the bus, you know, she dies. And she started screaming, screaming really loud. And some people heard her screams and did nothing. Didn't call the police, didn't come down. And she died. He murdered her. Uh, and two of my colleagues... Um, Bib Latine, who was teaching at Columbia, and John Darley, who was teaching with me at NYU, uh, 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 they raised the point that paradoxically, if, if there were only a few people who had heard her, her, her that is, the more people uh, who didn't help, uh, the, the, the paradox is, the, the more people present, the, the less likely anyone is to help. So that's the paradox. And they labeled it the bystander effect. Um, and and then they began to do experimental research, and it's become part of our 
our library of psychological knowledge. And essentially what it means is any kind of emergency, somebody just lying on the steps uh, or lying in the street uh, with or without blood, man or woman, uh, as soon as two people stop, uh, two people stop or look and do nothing, they create a social norm of, in that situation, of doing nothing. So when you pass by and you see others who uh, are, see what you see but ha are doing nothing, uh, the, the negative social norm impacts you. Even though they're strangers uh, and you know you should help, you don't help. So the bystander effect is, is like a paralysis. Um, and uh, like it's, it's a mental paralysis that freezes us from doing the good thing, ordinary thing. Now, in, in many of these situations, after a while, um, somebody will step up. Somebody will break that norm and say, do you need help or give help? And, and so we call that the power of one. Soon as someone does that, the norm changes. And the norm changes from do nothing to do something. And immediately a second person joins in uh, to help. Uh, so we call that the power of one. Be that person. Um, of course, I'm going to tell you in a moment you know, how you analyze the situation. You never take impulsive, um, irrational action, which could hurt you. We want you to be a, a long-lived, wise, and effective hero. Uh, we don't want you to be what, what, what I call an impulsive hero who acts you know, uh, out of emotion rather than out of reason. Uh, and then the power of two is be that second person, because once the second person does it, then anybody looking, then it becomes uh, justified to be involved to help. Part of uh, the, the question came up for me, and due to your research, I really am interested to see uh, what your thoughts are. When we talk about the bystander effect and the mental uh, paralysis, do you think um, that this way of constantly watching television, movies, uh, video games that have to do with extreme violence, um, you know, every television station in the United States around the uh, hours between 9 and 11, it's all um, crime shows. Uh, there's about ways of looking at what, uh, you know, people who do crime do that. And then th there's also all of the news, which is crime. And then movies who are all violent and all. Does that also add to the part of us being desensitized a bit? Um, in violence and cruelty, and we also you see it as this is the norm as human humanity. This is what it should be. What do you think? Yeah, about that, that? you raise a, you raise a really good point. We live in the United States of America in the most violent country in the world, partly because of the presence of guns, uh, and we've seen you know literally every week there is a shooting. Uh, I don't know since Columbine. There were hundreds and hundreds of shootings in, in schools and in businesses, people in the street. Uh, there are you know, thousands of homicides in, in America every year. Uh, there are hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of women being raped and abused uh, in America. So we live in a violent society, and that violence is uh, expanded or um, uh, made more impactful by all of the media, all the things you said. Almost the rewarded. Papers, evening news, uh, movies. Uh, and, and so it's not clear pe people get numb by it, but violence is becomes the norm. Uh, now, the other thing that I would add to that is uh, in, in recent years, most people now live uh, on cell phones, uh, live, live, live a life uh, in, let's call it, um, virtual reality. So many times... Uh, you don't even notice that you're walking by that is you're not even looking um, people you know you're not walking down the street looking around hey you're walking down the street with your cell phone to your ear <clears throat> uh, Starbucks coffee on the other hand sometimes listening to music uh, and so a new reason for to be a bystander is you don't even see the person there I mean you don't notice because you, you're not looking out you're not you're not looking out at, at the, the social situation that you're in so, so I think it's we begin to be, uh, as you said, anesthetized to violence, and we also begin to be immune to even noticing it. 
And one way of connecting with each other through the heroism and everyday heroism, you have explained two ways of being a hero. One is the impulsive reactive one, which something happens right there and maybe they jump in. And then there's another one, which is more of a proactive hero, which um, strategizes, looks at it and uh, analyzes it and converts the what you call a me to a we position. Can you talk a little bit about right. each one? Yes. So uh, I, probably now it's five years ago in New York City, uh, uh, a 50-year-old African-American man was going down to the subway uh, with his two daughters. And he gets down, he pays, he pays his fee, he walks through the turnstile. And as soon as he gets on the station, it was a very busy station. I think there were more than 75 people there. Some guy seems to be fainting or has a seizure and falls off the platform onto the track. He falls across the track. And if you're a New Yorker, you know that tr- subways come in uh, uh, schedule about every three minutes. So he looks at this. Nobody's helping. So there's the bystander effect. Nobody's saying anything. It's like everybody is frozen uh, and numb. He turns to a stranger and says, take care of my, my, my daughters. He jumps down, takes the guy who's lying across the tracks and puts him between the tracks, lay, lay, lays on top of him, presses him down. And at that moment, the train goes over his head. His children thought their father would, would be murdered, be, be decapitated. But in fact, there was only a half an inch between Wesley Autry's skull and the bottom of the train, which uh, if the man, if the, if the, if the victim was um, a breeze, uh, you know, pushed up, uh, he would have been decapitated. So that's an example. So he was called a super subway hero. He became a celebrity in New York and other places. But that's, that's, um, an impulsive and not wise hero because in the process of helping this guy, he could have been killed and then uh, would, would, would we still think of him as a hero? Certainly his children would not. Now, that, that example was all over the New York media and I guess throughout the country. Uh, so two weeks later and another subway station, the same thing happened. A guy fell on the track and some, some man, I think blocking on his name, who had who had heard the interview, I think it was with Rachel Maddow, uh, jumped down, dragged the guy to the platform, said, I need help. Two guys came, and the three of them lifted, lifted the guy up onto the platform. And so this is what we call a wise and reflective hero. They reflect on the situation. He did it very quickly, but having that past knowledge of, of uh, this Wesley Autry, what it means to be an impulsive hero, namely you could die, uh, he did the smart thing, the reflective thing, uh, uh, the non-reactive thing. And they got on this train and they went to work. Um, and, and so one of the things we propose is we want, we want, we want everyone to be, co- become wise and effective here. Effective means you achieve your goal, namely to help somebody to stop the bleeding, to uh, help somebody who's drowning, help somebody at, uh, um, at a house or a car on fire. But we want you to do it in a wise way, meaning you pause. As, as I said, we're, we're all going through our life. We all live in, in a bubble, an egocentric bubble. You press the pause button. You say, what's happening? Uh, you analyze it. What, what needs to be done? Can I do it? In many cases, you can't do it. Somebody's drowning. You don't know how to swim. Uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you're a fireman, for example, uh, you're trained not to go into a house that's on fire if it's above uh, level five, meaning the roof is likely to collapse. Uh, so you analyze the situation and then you take wise and effective action. Now, in some cases, but to, what we say in our hero program is you always must do something and we want you to do the right thing. In some cases, you call an ambulance, you call 911, you call other people, other people for help. Um, and so I've developed a training program where we go beyond just these labels. We train uh, kids in high school and college, and now we're moving into businesses uh, in the bystander effect, how to transform passive bystanders into active heroes. That's one of our six lessons. Uh, another one is how to transform people have a static fixed mindset into a gross mindset. A fixed mindset means I'm good at A, I'm bad at B. Women are not good at math. Uh, uh, blacks are not good at this. Asians are good at this. So it's really kind of prejudiced. Uh, that we put on ourselves and other people. And in fact, every ability, every, every talent is improvable with two things, practice and effort. When you fail, it's your first attempt at learning. 
Uh, and so you say, I, tr- I will try. I will try harder. I will try better next time. So we have these lessons that, that school, as I said, um, uh, schools or businesses license them from us. And then I or people on my, my uh, hip t- hip, heroic imagination, we call it hip, hip team, do uh, train them. Uh, and how to and how to uh, deliver this, uh, these lessons um, effectively. Now, one of the things in our lessons is they're all arranged around provocative videos. So it's not somebody comes up and lectures. Teacher, a teacher or, or a, a business leader shows a provocative video and then says, "What's happening in this video?" And then, "What would you do? Uh, have you ever been in a situation where you needed help and somebody helped you?" And then you describe that. Have you ever been in a situation where you needed help and nobody helped? When was that? Uh, have you been in a situation where you did or didn't help other people? So, so it's, it's a very dynamic uh, set of lessons. And our lessons now are in 12 countries around the world. Uh, and, uh, uh, in fact, I go you know, to Tehran, to Poland, to Hungary, to, po- uh, po- uh, to uh, Portugal, uh, to France, to uh, Netherlands, uh, to Sicily, where my family comes from. Uh, and we've, we've I, I teach them these lessons, and then they they begin to deliver it on their own. One of the uh, most amazing conversations as I was hearing from you is that it really requires us to also be present, not only present to who we are and our skills and what works for us and what doesn't and what part of us we can access uh, to bring out, but also to be present to our surroundings so that we have an idea and can analyze and look at what's necessary. When is it that I need to act? What skills do I have in order to act? Is what's going on in, uh, around me needs my help in in different ways and how extreme it is that it does need my uh, gift of being present. But as you said, m- most of the people right now, whether they're on drugs or uh, they're on um, marijuana, uh, their brain is fried, or they're just completely inside their cell phone and into their bubble, or, you know, talking right. to themselves and all of that. So it takes away that way of being present, and we all become more reactive. And sometimes when we get startled and frozen, we get reactive more about protecting ourselves. We don't actually right. go from a we Absolutely. to a me versus a me to a we. So that what absolutely yeah no you got it hitting it right on the head um so i mean again the, the i mean the, the key is for all of us aside from the hero thing is to learn how to be more mindful learn how to be you know in the moment because many of us are future oriented we're always on the way to somewhere else and mm-hmm. and with where we are is uh, just uh, a, a transient moment um but there are important things happening in that moment. Also, aside from uh, being sensitive to somebody else in need, uh, you could be in need. Uh, if you're not paying attention, uh, you could trip and fall on the sidewalk. Uh, if you're not paying attention, you could be hit by a car as, you, as a pedestrian. Uh, so it's just important, as you said, is for all of us to be more mindful of, our, our, of where we are in our, in our situation, in our setting, um, and uh, and again, there are times when you have to say, help, I need help. Uh, and it's very hard for us to do that. I mean, we're trained to be independent uh, and, and not do that. So part of our hero project is to say, not only uh, we'd like to train you how to be aware and sensitive to helping others in need, there may be a time when you are in need. And, and what do you do? Uh, and the important thing is we, we often downplay it. You know, uh, no, I can do it. I can do it on my own. I, I don't want to. I don't want to bother people. The moment you perceive that something's happening that could be dangerous, you say, "I need help." Now, this is also true. Uh, in many cases, you're walking and a, a woman is being stalked, and she notices somebody following her, uh, and essentially uh, it tries to minimize it. In fact, you know that that we say, we tell that woman, uh, "Go to the nearest person, a stranger or not." And say, I need your help. I think this man is stalking me. And soon as soon as you hook up with somebody else, that stalker will walk away. Uh, so again, become a social animal. Uh, that is, be be, be um, sensitive to your situation and be be aware of when you when you need help as well as when you can give help. Now, the other thing I'll mention is you you said we all live in our egocentric bubble. 
egocentrism is the enemy of heroism. Yes. Heroes are sociocentric, meaning heroes are always in every situation saying to themselves, I mean, um, I don't mean uh, people born heroes, but people who we train uh, in this heroic mentality in every situation saying, what can I do to make someone in this situation feel better, feel happier, feel confident, feel respected? Uh, rather than in every situation, I, I wonder if people know it's me. I wonder if they'll think I'm smart. I wonder if they'll think I'm pretty or handsome, whatever. So egocentrism is me. Egocentrism is the big I. And all of our programs are designed to change, as you said, the me to the we, I to us. Now, again, it also means, for example, giving compliments. Uh, compliments on how someone looks. Compliments on what people said. It's rare. You know, think think back the last time somebody gave you a compliment or you gave a compliment. We we don't do it because we feel we feel nervous. People love to get justifiable compliments. I often say to my class when I taught big class at Stanford, raise your hand if you've ever complimented a teacher on 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 a really good lecture. And there might be ten percent out of a thousand students who say yes. So you, we take things for granted. We never compliment our mother on, gee, that was a really good dinner. You, so you come to expect certain things, but, you know, you compliment your mother. And I also said, for example, all the, all the students at Stanford live in dormitories. Um, I said, do you know the name of the, how many of you know the name of the, the person who served you breakfast this morning? The, the, the servers all have to wear name tags. Nobody. Right. So they become objects. Yes. So I said, you know, go back. And when, when somebody serves you, you say thanks, even if it happens every day. Thanks, uh, Janie. Thanks, Bob. Uh, make them into, make them feel pride in what they do. Right. Connect to them as another human being, not just as an uh, object who uh, gives a service to us. Yeah, and, yeah. Sure, exactly. Like we're, so we're not a machine so we're taking something from. It's a human we connect to and we exchange services together or exchange a space together, actually. Yeah, I mean, in some cases, somebody gives you a service, you, you give them money, you, you pay for the thing. So you, um, you get gasoline, you pay a fee. Somebody washes your window, you pay a fee. But and I'm, what, what we're saying is somebody does a service for you and you don't, you don't exchange money, you exchange a compliment. You, or you simply say, thank you, I appreciate that. And it's and more important to say, thank you, give their name, uh, and put out your hand, shake your hand, shake their hand, say, hi, I'm Phil Zimbardo. Uh, and now, uh, well, let me add in, I live in San Francisco. I'm a New Yorker uh, by birth and for many, many years. And San Francisco is a wonderful city with one exception. We have 7,000 people who are living on the street, sometimes whole families, many elderly people, uh, many um, uh, uh, veterans uh, with PTSD. And most of them have survived by begging. To be a beggar is is um, a shameful position to be in, yes. um, and uh, and so pe- so because there's so many people, even stop giving money, uh, and they beg every everywhere. Now, what I do is I decide every morning: am I going to give fifty cents, a dollar, five dollars? And as I'm walking down the street or driving, I'll stop uh, and go to I go to a person who's beg who's begging. And I'll put, I'll put my hand out and say, hi, I'm Phil Zimbardo, what's your name? And then I say, do you live, do you live around here? Uh, and then I say, uh, I give, let's say a dollar, I give a dollar, and I say, uh, I'm, I'm ho- I hope your luck will improve. And what I've just done in that one minute, it only takes that one minute, I've transformed a homeless person into a person without a home. Yes. And I swear, at least half the time, they begin to tear up, men as well as, as, well as women. And so... What, we, what I'm saying is my notion that my new notion of what it means to be an everyday hero is a person who daily practices the social habits of heroism, uh, making uh, not only helping people in emergency, but making people feel respected, uh, making people feel um, uh, um, uh, welcome, uh, making fe- people feel that they they are, still have a place. Uh, at, at the ta- if you're religious, at God's table. Absolutely. I remember um, I was washing my car, and as you were talking, a homeless woman uh, came in, and uh, she it was so beautiful. She called me. She says, hey, beautiful woman. And I looked at her, and I thought, wow, 
this woman is so beautiful inside and out that she comes to me in that space and she could have just said, you know, can I have money? And she stood there and started talking to me and we explored how many kids she has, how long has she been on the street, how was life for her? And as I'm watching, you know, we're dialoguing and then at the end, you know, I gave her some money and I thanked her and she thanked me. And that day there was this experience of what you just said is more like, wow, I am, I'm living life with every human being around me in any shape or form, uh, which this is the beauty versus me being in my own bubble and the world is around and I'm not, you know, we're not interacting and we're not giving this gift of beauty to each other. But there has been this question that I've always wanted to ask you because, um, you know, I've come to many of your conferences in evolution of psychotherapy and around and I've always learned so much from you. Um, There's this question that I've always had of you because I know you have really experienced or um, experienced being in the research with all all of the both sides. And the question is not formed beautifully, so just bear with me. Um, And I hope that all listeners bear with me as I'm going through articulating it. I have the assumption, and it's only an assumption, um, that for some reason when people have experienced the rage or the hatred or something inside of them that just wants to go attack, um, somehow that chemical inside hijacks them in a way that even if the conversation of love and gratitude and everything else that is around them that they could switch and have maybe some sort of an experience or a result from this way they keep at the beginning keep choosing um, the violence or the rage or the hatred and I've, you know, I've been a therapist for 27 years, and I've watched people obviously go from, from one end to the other, hopefully, and I've experienced that beautifully at times. But it's so hard to get them off that internal drug to this other side. And sometimes it's just like I experience counterintuitiveness about who we are as a social being together. And I've always wanted to ask you, based on the research you've had, your experience, what are your thoughts and from one extreme to the other, what makes people tick this way where they will choose violence over gratitude and love? Well, it's a a profound question, of course. Um, But we have to step back and say, many people... Hello? Yes, I'm listening. Okay. Many people uh, have uh, suffered um, uh, abuse. Many people have failed socially as well as in, in business, in, 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 um, in schools. Um, and so for a lot of us, or a lot, not me, for a lot of people, they have a reservoir of negative things. People have done bad things. They've heard people say bad things about them. Uh, they, uh, they fail when they think they should have succeeded. Somebody else got the promotion that they know they deserve. So, so sadly, for many, many people, it could be a, think of it as a reservoir that is filled with dark, dirty water, and it's and it's uh, and it it overflows uh, in situations where it's not even appropriate. Um, so they're more ready to be hostile than kind. Uh, they're more ready to attack because uh, they're ready. They're always. They're always on the defense. Um, they, so you, they come to have a, a negative mental set of the world that everybody is a potential enemy rather than a potential friend, a potential supporter. Uh, and, it's, and, and then, of course, uh, we get back to your opening uh, message, they read about it in newspapers. They see it on television. They see it in movies of people being harassed, or raped, abused, um, um, uh, police shooting, uh, pre- pre- mindless police shooting. Uh, so you can't even imagine the police are there to protect you. Um, so it's, 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 you know, it's so hard to break through. And, and that's my goal with the Heroic Imagination Project is to get our message out more widely to say, you can change all of that because inside of each of us, 
is that child, that little child, and so much research that little children who see an animal in need or another kid in need always come to their aid. Always, always, always. No, but not even thinking. Um, uh, infants, uh, will, you know, will turn, to, uh, turn toward another infant, uh, who seems to be in distress, who's crying. Uh, and so, and so it's, it's how do we, how do we release that inner child, the inner, inner, uh, uh, socially, the inner child that wants to be socially engaged, um, uh, rather than um, uh, the adult in us who feels um, um, uh, unacceptable, unacceptable by society, um, because we're all at heart we're really all good people, uh, and and it's uh, I like to think of it as it's the negative is a covering, and and our job in society as as teachers as therapists, as you are, uh, as parents, is to peel off that, that uh, negativity. Uh, it, it's, it's, it, I just had the image, uh, you know, somebody has some, some skin disease, uh, that the ideal is you take a medicine or you take a, 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 face, a face mask and you peel it off and underneath is, you know, the, the glowing you. Yes. There's this concept of revenge that I've watched uh, where a lot of violence happens due to the concept of revenge. As you said, yeah, uh, the people have her- been hurt, traumatized as a child, and um, they have at times generalized, as you said, and at times hold on to that anger that one day now they're going to be the perpetrator and they're going to be, it's almost like you know, power has been associated with violence and being a perpetrator versus power being right. associated with love and kindness and gratitude. And somehow they hold that revenge until it's done. They still doesn't make them feel that much better nor powerful. Right. But it, the illusion of that revenge is is somehow there. And in your trainings, how do you deal with people who hold on to that rage in a revengeful way and not let it go? Yeah, I mean the important thing is is to, um, in a, in a kind and caring way, getting them to talk it out, to say, you know, where is it coming from? Again, as a therapist, you know, as a teacher, uh, we we stop. We identify, you know, in my view, this is what, when you say this or you say it that way, we act this way, uh, it sounds like uh, uh, you're being vengeful or uh, show, showing some revenge. Uh, and so the key is, is there one or more earlier situations in your life which um, in, uh, embodied in you some negativity? Now, again, it could be that you know someone treated you badly as a child uh you were bullied as a child and now you're a grown-up uh do you become a, now do you become a, a, a grown-up bully uh or do you work to prevent other other bullies from from doing their, their negative thing um so it, it's really um i think it's believing for example all therapists believe at heart that the patient they're dealing with no matter what the, the psychological problems are you know uh you can get in get into that mind get into that that mentality and bring out the best of best of them and depending on the kind of therapy you get them to realize there's a negative thought the negative cognitions the negative emotions they're feeling uh and and then realizing what what they have unexpressed so the key is getting people to express negative feelings getting the fact that most of us are, have some implicit prejudice, implicit bias, and the key is getting it out of the, the dark recesses of the mind and, and putting it on the table to say, you know, when you say that, uh, I think you mean you dis, you dislike women, or you dislike black people, or you dislike Asian people, or you dislike Sicilians, uh, as my, my uh, uh, family has been, is. Uh, so it, it's, it's doing the kind of thing a good therapist does but you know, without the credentials of being a therapist, uh, and without your goal of trying to change another person, but doing what you can to make them become more self-aware of their negative thoughts, their negative feelings, and then help point them in the direction of, uh, uh, if you will, 
revealing or uh, uh, prompting, uh, uh, in, uh, helping to emerge the good in all of us. And I think that your project, Heroic Imagination, and um, for the listeners, please go to heroicimagination.org. Um, the beauty of this type of work is obviously a lot of people who have that not necessarily come to therapy to get healed. Thank God for the ones who actually do get help and, you know, release themselves of this. But as we're looking at the, what we talked about, the violence and, um, you know, the, the shooting at the school or many of the mass shootings that are happening, things that are happening in politics and society, it's just a lot of people who do not go into therapy. However, the type of, um, you know, the anger, rage, and revenge allows itself to keep creating the next level and the next level of violence and the beauty of what you're doing is to bringing uh, this concept to businesses to people out there to youth to people who are out there to start creating reward and positiveness and pleasantness into the concept of being loving being heroic being socio uh, centered being out there present connecting with people from a beauty and and a and a human to human connection place where they can feel fulfilled and the chemicals that run in their body are from the gratitude and love and presence might also uh, create this blessing for them where it becomes so pleasant that they probably would I'm hoping would love to get <coughs> over the other side of the anger and rage that at times you know gives them motivation to live. It's more like sh can we have other motivating factors to live as far as the chemicals in our body and our actions and all of that. So that um, I see that as the beauty of what you have started um, with the heroic it, imagination. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it, it's uh, so uh, the positive um, hormone is oxytocin. You know. So when when you're feeling good, when when you're uh, uh, playing with a child or a puppy, um, you cannot stop this chemical reaction, the oxytocin, which kind of amplifies um, the, the, your connection to others, your your positive uh, feelings, um, and uh, and so this is this is one of the reasons to you know be connected to other people. Uh, friendship kindness caring releases these positive hormones in you uh and 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 they, sometimes it's like a cascade uh and you feel same thing like giving a compliment afterwards not only does the compliment receiver feel good but just the fa the smile on their face the tear in their eye makes you feel good as well so it's not a selfish thing to say okay i'm going to I'm going to give a compliment. I'm going to do this. And, and it's never as an obligation. Uh, it's always as uh, forging the bonds of the human connection. That's the key. That is, we are all social animals. And we want to be social animals that make the world better. And what we say to, to kids, you start in your family. Uh, you start, you know, complimenting your mother for the dinner, complimenting, um, you know, your dad for you know, working, working hard, uh, complimenting your brothers or sisters for helping you with your homework. Uh, and then it, and then it goes on. But even, for example, also, uh, in most families, there's always some um, Uncle Charlie who t tells jokes at, you know, family gatherings. And sometimes they're sexist jokes, sometimes they're racist jokes. And people tolerate it, but it's really unpleasant. Yes. So we teach you what we call courageous conversation. You want Charlie to stop that, but you don't want to put him on the defensive. You don't want to make him feel bad. But you, we show you how you tell Uncle Charlie how, how you like the fact that he wants to entertain. You like the fact that he wants to make people feel better. But then you say, Charlie, Uncle Charlie, imagine if one of my friends who's Jewish or one of my friends who's African-American or a woman was here, you know, they would be upset. So what I really, really would like you to do, Uncle Charlie, is think of, think of some new jokes and, and try them out on me, you know, that don't include, you know, those people or women or, or you know, people of different races or ethnicities. And so you don't want him to be defensive. You don't want him to be upset. I, you want him to continue to trying to um, do his, his role has become Uncle Charlie the joke teller. You just want to change the content. In the same way, uh, uh, in school, you might have a teacher who says a sexist, a racist comment. Your job is, for maybe anonymous, you send a note 
and say, did you realize that when you say this, it's, a, it's offensive to students in our class? And, and I wish you would not do that. Uh, so again, uh, you don't want, you don't want to go up and confront a teacher because if you're a student, you know, uh, you don't want to, you don't want to be on, on the, um, dark side of, of the teacher, but you have to do something. So we say, your job is always to do something. And what we teach you is how to do it in the best possible way in your school, in your home, in your community. And then when enough of us do it, as we, what I call create a hero squad, we change our nation for the better. Yes. It's like the tipping point would happen. So we only have five more minutes. I just wanted to go over what you had said about power of one, do something, be the first, be an ally, dare to be different, give a compliment every day, and the power of two, ask for help directly with your needs, ask two people, three people, create straight requests. Um, and different, ask different requests from different people to help you and be with you and ally, create allies in that mode and the beauty so that you could have that. Right. Yes. Yeah, th- those, those are the key messages. But I'm saying, wh- I, the, the, the phrase is, uh, all of us are heroes in training. Mm-hmm. That is, we, every day uh, we learn how to be a more effective hero. And it's in, I'm saying it's in little things. It's not running into a fire and to save somebody's life. Uh, I, we, you know, we encourage that as well to do, but do it wise. But it's little things. Like for example, I'm semi handicapped. I have a cane. Whenever, whenever I'm in, let's say, in the hospital, other places, the elevator comes. I'm the first one in the elevator, and what I do is I put my cane against the door. Mm-hmm. When people come in, I say I have it. You know, they look at me and they still put their hand. I said, No, I have it. So I hold the door open with a simple gesture, and then as people, when the door opens or we get to the floor, I still do that. It's a, a minimal thing, but it creates a positive. So somebody says, somebody's doing something for me. Yes. So, I'm saying, it's that, that, so it's not helping anybody in distress. It's just saying, I respect, I respect you, and I'm, I want to do something which is easy for me to do because mm-hmm. I have a cane, and I can reach, reach across. Um, same thing as I said with you know giving money to a homeless people a person, say who you are, shake their hand, look them in the eye, uh, and the key is what can you do to make somebody feel uh, proud to be a human being, proud to be uh, the best of what they can be, best of, of who they are. I think we all yearn to have significance, and this is such a beautiful way that every day we create some sort of significance for ourselves in being a human being among everybody else on this earth. Uh, with all of these yeah. little things that are right there, present moment, where I can, you know, make a difference in somebody else's life in a more beautiful right. way. Thank and thank you for being and with us. Thank you. No, no, thank you for having me. But again, it's. It's be in the moment. Yes. You know, don't always be, you know, we're all on a path of life, you know, uh, but don't be looking about what you're going to do tomorrow when, when enjoy, be mindful, enjoy th- this day because this is, this is what you know you have. You're never quite sure what's going to be tomorrow. Absolutely. Um, it's a joy to always learn from you. You were always on the front line of uh, moving forward with um, controversial matters, and uh, <laughs> and yet uh, you know you you put yourself in it, and you're an active participant in everything that you do, and not just the bystander or an observer. And I think that's the beauty uh, that you bring not only to the field of psychology, to the education, and to the world. So thank you, and thank you for being with me and my listeners. And I appreciate your inviting me to be your guest. Uh, let's do it again sometime. Absolutely. And for everyone who's listening, thank you for listening with your heart. And I wish for you to create an amazing life and every moment for yourself and everyone around you. And until next week, take good care of yourself and bye-bye. You're listening to The Inner Voice with Dr. Fujran Zain. Only on LA Talk Radio.